The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Well, let me read again the verses from this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 1. It's page 995 in the Church Bibles. I'm not going to go through and uh, uh, rehearse the whole uh, study. Uh, You'll be grateful for that. But um, for some of you, uh, this will be slightly repetitious, um, but not particularly so. Uh, Verse 3 of 2 Timothy 1, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Father, help us as we just briefly look at this, that, uh, that, that we might hear your voice and trust you and obey you for your Son's sake. Amen. Well, our purpose this morning was to look at verses 5, 6, and 7. Characteristically, we spent an inordinate amount of time in verse 5, and then we're chasing our tail from that point. We did get into verse 6, and in services 1 and 2, mostly all the way through to the end. In service 3, not so. Uh, We noted the fact that Paul's encouragement in verse 5 Uh, gave uh, basis to his exhortation in verse 6. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, he says, and as I think of that, I want to remind you of something. And then he says, I want to remind you of the absolute importance of making sure that although you have received a particular gift, Timothy, it is your responsibility to make sure that you fan it into a flame, that the benefit of the gifting of God to the people of God is not automatic, that the principle that we often refer to in Philippians, where Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure, uh, falls in line with this as well. And in at least a couple of the services, I made mention of an event that I had seen yesterday, uh, where a a girl who was running in a two-mile race I uh, thought she had won the race, but there was still one lap left to run, and she, she stopped with one l- lap to go. She stopped in first place with one lap to go. It was very sad, because she had worked tremendously hard to put herself in that position. And it struck me again just how easy it is for somebody to have started very well and yet never have to have made it all the way to the final lap to rest the tape. And Timothy is to make sure, this is Paul's great concern, is to make sure that he's not resting on his laurels, that he's not looking back to uh, the gifting of God, but he is engaged in this. And when I went out to my car, I had something sticking on in, in my door handle. Uh, people put all kinds of things, all kinds of places for me, but I presume this was in somewhat in relationship to the point of emphasis about making sure that you're working at what you're doing. And it is a cartoon, uh, the Flying McCoy Brothers. I'm not familiar with this from the Akron Beacon Journal. But it, the scene is of uh, a gentleman and his wife uh, and a salesman in uh, a shop that is selling um, athletic equipment, training equipment. And they're standing uh, at the, side by side uh, with two uh, treadmills with all the electronic gadgetry on the front of them. And the salesman. Uh, points to the one, and he says, and this is our deluxe model. It holds five pairs of slacks, two sweaters, three dresses, and an, o- and an overcoat. And uh, uh, it, it, it was, it was, uh, that ought to be a, a dig in the ribs for all of us who wasted an inordinate amount of money on an exercise machine and have used it as a coat hanger ever since. But anyway, uh, the danger that we recognized this morning was just that danger of uh, realizing that the the presence of giftedness may be marred. And what I failed to get to in 3, I did in verse 1 and 2, and I said that I had written a note to myself as I pondered this, beware, Alistair, of being glad. Beware of being glad. And glad uh, refers to greedy, lazy, angry, dirty. 
And we acknowledge the fact that the presence of giftedness in the life of an individual or in the lives of individuals, in the life of a congregation, will be severely marred by greediness, by laziness, by anger, and by impurity. And the sad story of many a life, of many a great gifted individual, is a story of collapse. It's the story of withering. It's the story of disintegration. It's the sad story that is represented all too many times. And Paul's great concern is, Timothy, I remind myself of your sincere faith, and I remind you of the absolute importance of fanning this gift into a flame. He then wraps it up with another word of encouragement in verse 7, as he reminds Timothy of these divine resources. And you will notice that he doesn't say, for God gave you a spirit of fear, which he did, but God gave us not a spirit of fear, a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. He includes himself in that. He, Timothy, and all of God's servants are in need of the reminder, especially in relationship to the challenges of the ministry that Timothy would face in Ephesus. All kinds of external threats, internal pressures. And it is customary in the study of 2 Timothy, and I said this in our introduction, to view this verse as being peculiarly relevant to Timothy. To Timothy as one who is diffident, he's frail, and uh, he, he's just uh, a bit of a poor soul, really. And so often the way that Timothy is taught is, is, you know, specifically related to an individual who really doesn't have much clue what's going on and is a fearful fellow and everything else. And I used to actually buy that. I, I don't anymore, because it, it, it makes then these characteristics somewhat abnormal when an actual fact is perfectly normal for the pastor to face the tendency to quit, to be overwhelmed, or to be ashamed of the gospel. Now, that may take you by surprise. I don't think it should. But what I'm suggesting to you is that this exhortation in verse 7 is not for a certain kind of person, a kind of weak-kneed, diffident soul called Timothy, but it is a necessary word for all who are engaged in pastoral ministry, to be reminded of the fact that God has given us a spirit not of fear. Timothy was going to be without Paul, a daunting task without any, without any doubt at all, and it would be a great encouragement to him to be reminded of this threefold blessing. This God the Spirit has been given to each one of us in Jesus. We thought about that in our first point. And the power of the Holy Spirit within us is a spirit, and I think this is the, the emphasis. You can uh, debate this on your own after coffee, uh, but, but the, the, the picture is that the Spirit of God indwells the child of God in, in, in Christ, and then the power of the Holy Spirit within is a spirit, small s, of power and of love and of self-control. Power that enables Timothy and all who, like him, are responsible for these things to keep on when faced with the temptation to capitulate or to collapse. It's the same word that is used in Colossians 1, where he talks about being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. And then the very next phrase is, for endurance. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may do dramatic and powerful things. No, so that you may actually not quit. So that you might just keep going. Now, I don't tell everybody this, but I routinely leave the ministry on Sunday evenings. I uh, in the early days, it used to alarm my wife dreadfully. She would be very concerned. Now she doesn't even listen to me when I talk. She hears me going up the stairs. I'm taking my clothes off as I go. I've got to get myself a proper job, I say to myself on Sunday evenings. There must be something else. I used to say, I'll work for the post office. Now she shouts after me, you couldn't even get a job for the post office. You're unemployable. And it is that kind of encouragement that keeps me here Sunday by Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. 
Now, I want you to know that that's not unusual. I, 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 I overstate the case. Power, love, the love that bears all things, that believes all things, that hopes all things, that endures all things, the love that is indispensable for a pastor when, like Timothy, he faces his detractors and he faces the defectors. And self-control, that self-control that is vital in the secret place in Timothy's private life and in the fulfilling of his responsibilities in his public life. What a wonderful encouragement this opening paragraph must have been, not only to Timothy, but also to his congregation. Because in actual fact, what Paul provides us with here is an example of what's involved in actually exhorting and encouraging one another. And one of the ways we do that is when we pray together. And if you look at this paragraph, I think you will see that at least these elements are present. He is thankful and he's faithful in prayer. He's warm in his friendship. He's encouraging in his words, and he's purposeful in his exhortation. You want to encourage one another? Be thankful and faithful in prayer. Be warm in your friendship. Be encouraging in your words, and be purposeful in your exhortations. Not only will we follow the pattern of Paul, but the pattern of the Lord Jesus himself. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.